If we look at Africa, the crisis that exists in Africa, completely created by capitalism. In the 1980s, South Africa had what was considered the most advanced working class in the world. They were politically the most developed. They were fighting the apartheid system out in the street. Discussion about socialism was for, front and foremost. They clearly saw the need to transform society from the youngest to, to the oldest. That especially, it was, it was very impressive to see young people leading that struggle against the apartheid regime. But now, what we see, not only in South Africa, but in a number of countries in Africa, is that we have a black face on the corporate agenda. In South Africa, you have a layer of politicians that have risen to the surface either elected by the ANC or as representatives of corporate agenda, but yet the shanty towns still exist. The crisis around AIDS and malaria go forward. Unemployment, poverty, and all its degrading forms is something that we see all, all around that area, which was once the vanguard of, of the working class movement. And we have to see that when that movement was thrown back for a number of reasons, that, that there's a price that's paid by people around the world. When you stop fighting for revolutionary change in society, when you stop fighting for the reforms that revolutionary change will bring, you pay a price. You see things degenerate, they don't go forward. We just don't stagnate, we actually degenerate as a people. But in the midst of all of that, to be fair, we have, in general, a crisis that, that capitalism has really uh, put on us environmentally, to the living standards that we have here and in the third world. And the, the, um, in the midst of that, there's, there's the kind of the rumbling of something new to, taking place. And in Venezuela, we can hear the discussion about socialism taking place. Not everybody understands exactly what socialism is, perhaps, but they know that if there's a confrontation with the ruling class, and the most powerful ruling class in the world is the US ruling class, if there's a confrontation with imperialism, if there's if talk about redistributing the wealth of society, then it's got to have something to do with socialism. And we benefit from that type of discussion taking place. In, in the midst of that, you see Mexico and Oaxaca, a teacher's strike, which basically expands into an urban uprising to take down a very corrupt government. And there's no way to pull it back, really. It, it, the more they actually try to stop it, the more they inflame deeper and deeper sectors of the class. Not only the teachers, but it goes into the peasantry and workers in that whole area, the indigenous people that have been repressed for time and memorial. So th there's a struggle that's boiling against the system as we know it, against the, uh, the, the agenda that the ruling class have handed to the rest of the world, and that they're attempting to shove even at a quicker pace to the American working class. And it's a, a confused battle. Not everybody that's involved in that struggle even understands what socialism is, but they know that there needs to be a direct confrontation. So what do we do when we look around us and we see the ugliness in society, and there's plenty of it that we can point to? It's tempting. It's, uh, it's very tempting to be sympathetic to people, especially young people who are impatient and say, look, let's just pick up the gun and just you know, take these people out. And in history, many, many decent people have gotten to the point where they felt that there was just no time for discussion any longer. We have to just take that corrupt regime out in any way, by any means necessary, so to speak. But we look in this country in particular, and after the discussion that we just had, we see we have two political parties. Neither of them say that they can stop a war. The Democrats said they could slow down the pace of the war, perhaps, but they're, they're unprepared to stop it, even though the vast majority of Americans want an end to this war. <laughs> and then we have to say to ourselves, OK, we live in a democracy in the sense that we've elected political leaders, but yet working people in this country, the poor, don't really decide any of the major issues in front of us. There's an illusion that a decision is being made, but when you get down to it, the major, major issues are not decided by us. Whoever voted on the minimum wage here, we elect politicians who then go on to have a debate about it, but that, that feeling that we have a mandate and that we have control over what they do, is, it's just not there. We weren't allowed to end that war. The millions of people out in the streets did not end it. 
So you say to yourself, even though we elected these politicians, there's a disconnect between their, their allegiance to the ruling class and the so-called democratic values that they're supposed to represent the electorate, the people that have voted them in. So what do we do? We, we see corporations like Walmart. They seem like they're like a runaway train. It seems like nobody can come up against them, even when they prove that co corporations like Walmart have looted the, the, the uh, taxpayers' money by you know, using social services because the wages are so low. They, they, when you get a job at Walmart, they, they give you your responsibilities and they also give you instructions on how to apply for food stamps and Medicaid because you most likely qualify if you work for that corporation. But nobody's, nobody's grabbing them and saying, stop thief. But they are the biggest thieves, the largest corporation in the United States and worldwide. <clears throat> it's just not acceptable to say, we're going to organize a bloody skirmish with, with the people that are running this country. We're going to try to get some arms and basically just take as many as we can out, regardless of what the outcome is. We have a responsibility because those methods are not really respected, let's face it. The methods of individual terrorism have been discredited. There was a period maybe in the 60s where they had a glow of sort of heroism about them. And we can admit that maybe the motives of some of the people that led these movements were, were honorable motives, but let's face it, the results did not lead to a society that was transformed from capitalism to socialism. In addition to the implication that individual terrorism has in the minds of people who have seen the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, Al-Qaeda, uh, the, the bombing of the World Trade Center, all of these, the, the phenomenon of the past 20 years, for instance, those methods have become even more discredited. You cannot lead mass movements of people with secretive uh, methods of, of individual terrorism. You know, just trust the leader and, and we'll work underground and we'll change society. So does that mean that our hands are tied? That, you know, as, as the speakers in the previous discussion said, you have to accept the status quo as it is. We say absolutely not. We have to fight for reforms, but we have to do that in a revolutionary way. How do you fight for reform? How do you change the system in any way and yet still point to a change in society farther off down the road? Well, we, we have to prove ourselves in struggle. It's not just a question of getting people to follow us. We have to prove that we have some understanding of the way the world works. We cannot be an isolated leadership. We cannot be like the shining path, you know, nobody's met the leader, but you know, his, his directives are gonna be sent, you know, in, in through the underground cells. This has got, when you organize the working class, it's gotta be out in the open programmatically. You've gotta let people know what, what you stand for. And the, the role of that type of leadership is to consolidate the gains that we've won, not only in this country, but internationally, but consolidate them historically and theoretically. For instance, the leadership of the civil rights movement, especially Martin Luther King at the end of his life was talking about democratic socialism. He understood that they had taken to the streets again and again and again, but in the period of the late 60s, they knew they needed to consolidate those gains politically. How was that gonna happen? Well, he, he understood on a certain level and and the people that, that were around him, really the militants in the civil rights movement understood that, that they needed to build their own organizations politically, that they needed to have confidence not only to defend, uh, to defeat the agenda of white supremacy, but also big business. That's why the Poor People's Campaign was started. King understood, and that layer around him understood that that, that movement needed to be taken further, to be consolidated in a political way. And one of the most significant events of the civil rights movement, I would say the apex of it, was the sanitation worker strike in 1968 in Memphis, the place where King was assassinated, actually. Not a coincidence, in my opinion. But where the working class in Memphis started to feel their power, especially the black working class, that they could transform society. And it led to a cascade of events after that in the 60s and the 70s. The the Detroit Revolutionary Union Movement, drum, uh, the, the growth of the Black Panthers in their healthiest phase, what, what represented those things. And it, it was an attempt to consolidate politically what had been won on the streets. And there's a, re a real need for that. So rather than pose social movements against uh, political action, you need to consolidate them. You need to see those social movements and take the program that comes out of those movements and 
fight for that on a, on a broader scale. 